There's been a uh, there's been a nice buzz in the building this week and uh, and today in anticipation of this evening. It's nice to see everyone turn out. Um, and uh, in particular, you know, the uh, third week in April, things are getting a little serious. And uh, it's nice to see the room uh, fill up for tonight's um, speaker. Uh, join us uh, tomorrow afternoon in the uh, Stubbins room, one to uh, six. Uh, Joseph Desponzio from Columbia, John Dixon Hunt uh, from Penn, our own uh, Ed Eigen, our own Sonia Dumpelman, Anita Beresbieta, Antoine Picon, Erica Naginski, uh, Ed Alia on uh, claiming landscape as architecture. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome Bas Metz uh, for the final uh, evening lecture in the landscape series this year. Bas Metz is um, founder of uh, the Bureau Bas Metz uh, from Brussels, Belgium. And uh, he works through a range of conceptual landscape strategies, uh, primarily for, for public space. Uh, he's got uh, for, uh, for a relatively emergent office an extraordinary portfolio of work, both in the ground and on the boards. As we were working, um, Emily Waugh and Mohsen and I and the Harvard Design Magazine team were working on the issue number 36 on the core of landscape architecture. Um, we, we had this notion collectively that while the magazine has really quite represented landscape uh, in a very vigorous way over the years, um, we felt as though uh, the magazine had often represented uh, a particular generation or a particular set of voices. And so we framed for ourselves an editorial challenge, which was to identify maybe two dozen practices around the world uh, that without using the word young, because in our culture that would be inappropriate, describing emerging practices that we thought would describe a kind of thickening, a robustness in the field internationally. And so I'll leave you to that issue of the Harvard Design Magazine. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. It is out now just last week. Um, and uh, in that format, I found one of the more interesting responses was from, was from tonight's um, speaker. Uh, in addition to an extraordinary array of projects with uh, some of the world's leading uh, architects, including projects with Frank Gehry and Rex, among others, um, Basmetz also teaches. Uh, he uh, teaches at the La Cambra School of Architecture in Brussels. He's also been a visiting member of faculty at the Berlaga in uh, Rotterdam and uh, at the Malaké in, uh, in Paris. Um, he has, uh, among other things, recently received um, the French Prize for Young Architects in 2007 and 2008. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome Bas Metz. Hello, good evening. Thank you very much for this kind of introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to show you the... the a bit the research we've been doing the last six years. It's a, it's a, it's a real honor and a, and a true pleasure to be here and to be able to share that with you. I'm truly fascinated with aerial photographs. I think from the air, and these are pictures that I have taken myself out of the airplane, from the airplane, the distance makes the territory look more abstract, and this abstraction makes it more readable, more comprehensible. And this is true for, for natural landscapes where suddenly topography, hydrography, and vegetation seem um, to be part of one single logic, logic and the, the distance and the framing makes you, makes you read this, makes this uh, visible. But it's also true for um, interventions by man. And here I show you a picture of uh, the Jefferson Grid, somewhere between Minneapolis and, uh, and New York where suddenly the, 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 um, the overlay of a man-made intervention makes the landscape uh, visible. Like, for example, these forested areas that, are, that seem to be trimmed by this, uh, this uh, system of the Jefferson grid. In a more subtle way, the grid reveals the passage of a small valley uh, through this, uh, uh, on, on this picture. But it also, for example, helps read the different um, um, composition of the, of the soil, as you can see in this image. And so I, I, I start with these two extremes, the, 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 the very natural landscape that follows, follows physical laws and where everything seems to be part of one system, and then this more man-made um, landscape that helps reveal the, the existing terrain. I like to show these images because then suddenly, when we arrive in my country, in Belgium, 
we don't have the natural strong landscape features and we don't have the strong man-made intervention. There's something very strange happening where all the elements of the landscape are simultaneously present, but in a very fragmented and unrelated way. So forests don't seem to, s to follow any logic. There is no much resistance from the landscape towards any development, and there's an enormous urban sprawl um, happening um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the flat uh, territory. And the, 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 the kind of systemic value that landscapes uh, make strong and make, make, uh, make them have a, a resistance against development seems to be lacking. <coughs> and um, I was very interested by this, this, this very peculiar situation. And when you start going into it in, in, a, in a more profound way, for example, here on a, on a satellite map of the built space in Europe, you can actually see Here it is. You can read Belgium as a kind of stain on the map. <laughs> and I saw that my office six years ago after having lived in Paris for eight years and having been about, let's say, about everywhere except for in Belgium. It was really a kind of comeback after six years. And so I was at the same time fascinated and, and, and revolted by this, this, this very different condition. Of course, many have um, written about it before me. Um, Zeki Vigano, as you may know, uh, called it a Citta Diffusa, or the, the La Ville Nebuleuse, the urban sprawl. And coming back to Belgium and, and, and starting many projects in, 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 in Belgium at the beginning, our idea was how, how can we create a landscape? How can we forget this urban sprawl and create a proper landscape that can anchor this, this, this endless sea of, of, uh, of little houses, of little developments, can anchor these constructions within uh, the territory. And so we started um, mainly in Belgium and then started exporting in a, in a, in a kind of way the, 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 this kind of knowledge, this kind of methodology in different countries in Europe and um, recently around the globe. So I'd like to show you how we developed this methodology in Belgium and I'll show you two projects, one in Brussels, um, one in Ingelmünster, and then go abroad and show you how this kind of um, this kind of methodology that helps us read a landscape can actually be used in, a, in, a, in any uh, situation. Here I make a zoom. This is not working really. Ah. This is Brussels, Antwerp, Ghent, Kortrijk, Rotterdam. Actually, you can see the, the, the border with the Netherlands when the sprawl really, really is, is, a, is very active. And it's really interesting because in the, the whole of Belgium, you cannot talk about cities or, or open spaces anymore. It's all one condition, this kind of endless Brodecker city um, that I think is, 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 is really interesting because more and more when, when we walk abroad, we see that this kind of urban sprawl is becoming apparent. Uh, in, in France, it's become a, the, a real topic that the, these last couple of years. And so in a way, we took Belgium as a prototype, as a kind of, um, we said, uh, yeah, it's, it's too late. Huh? We, we, we inherited this. We never created this ourselves. That, that's generations before us. What to do with that? And so we said, maybe we should stop looking at the, 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 at the build space and try to, try to see what's behind this build space. And it's really interesting to, to, to understand that these two maps are actually the same maps because they don't seem to, to have anything in common. But actually, this is the, the, the hydrography, the, the, the water system of the lowlands of the northern part of Belgium and the southern part of the, the, the Netherlands. And drawing these maps really helps us get a new view on, um, on, on these territories. And so this is the first drawing of all the, the water, then trying to, to, to clean it up a little bit, to, to start to, to, to see systems. And I think cart cartography is, is, is really key um, to, to getting a better understanding of the, 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 the existing territory. For example, suddenly here we understood that within the northern part of Belgium, there's a number of parallel rivers, all of them lying at about 20 to 25 kilometers one from another. 
that are draining a flat territory, because right? the lowlands or the flatlands um, are characterized by, by a, a, a minimal difference in, uh, in topography. And so the, 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 the water that falls on this land when it rains needs to be drained towards the, the North Sea. And so it's really interesting for us only to understand that, that these rivers are not rivers that bring the, the glacier water through the, the, the country to end up in the ocean, but it's merely a kind of local evacuation of the water that would fall out, out of the sky and that needs to be brought to the, to the ocean. So it's very different from the, 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 the Rhine, very different from the, the, um, the Rhine that you can see here, or the, the, the Meuse, that created the Euro Delta that, that, uh, that lies in the, in the south of, uh, of the Netherlands. And so coming from this map, we, we, we looked at the, 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 the real length of those smaller rivers at the, the high difference between the source and, uh, and the sea level. And we actually understood that it's, it's not at all, uh, it's a very different system. The, the, those rivers are about 100 kilometers long. The high difference is really never more than 100, 120 meters. And for example, if you compare with the, 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 the Rhine, the Rhine is 2,400 kilometers long, and the height difference is more than 2,000 meters. So it's, it's, it's a very different situation, and we need a very different approach, a very different way of, uh, of dealing um, with these smaller rivers. And I come back to this image, because this, this cartography is really key to this understanding. Um, I, I often tell the, my collaborators in the office that they should imagine that they're on a, on a, on a boat arriving to, uh, to the Americas, seeing land and sketching the land as the, the explorer, look, these explorers would, have, would do um, 600 years ago, and really try to, 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 to design anew what we see, to, to, to forget what we know, and, and, and take Google Earth, take, take, take any kind of picture, and, and redesign what you see, and try to, to, to um, with, a, with an open mind, in a way, reveal the, 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 the unseen. I will show this um, by the example of, of, a, of a, um, a vision for 2040 that we developed for the, the, the city of Brussels. The city of Brussels, and you can see this, this, um, this sprawl arriving to the city, you can see, or you can vaguely see a, a, a valley passing through. And this valley actually um, is marked by, by, a, by a canal connecting Antwerp through Brussels with Charleroi. And it's the only re remnant of the, the, the water system running through Brussels because the main river has been canalized um, uh, 200 years ago. And so it's interesting to see that the, 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 the um, even if the river has been lost, the, the, the contour lines, of course, are there and are um, very apparent in the, the infrastructure itself, the railroad tracks that were um, constructed parallel to the, the, the contour lines, creating a kind of infrastructure of, uh, or, or valley of parallel uh, infrastructures. If we would then overlay the, the existing green, we've, we got a very interesting uh, image because there there doesn't seem to be any interrelation between the, the, these fragmented green spaces and the topography of the valley. And for a long time we thought that was, a, that was really a problem because the, 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 um, the resistance to any kind of development of any kind of green can only be assured when there's an inter, inter, uh, interrelationship, when there's an interaction between topography, hydrography, vegetation, when they become a system, and we call this a syst systemic value, of a, of a green structure. And so we thought this is really problematic because all these green safe spaces seem fragmented, are on their own, and so are, are quite fragile to any kind of uh, pressure from development. And for, for a couple of years in different projects, we tried to reinforce the valley as a new structure. And, and any time we said, ah, oh, we have to replant the valley, the valley that had, be, had been deforestated um, for, uh, for uh, industrial reasons, to suddenly, because of this map that we made with the, the, the parallel rivers, we said, oh, maybe, the, the, maybe it's not the big river and maybe it's not this big valley running through Brussels, but maybe it's more um, a system, as said, that drains the flat land. 
And maybe it's more a kind of ramifications of little streams, of little ditches, of, of, uh, of waterways that actually amounts to a, a capillary hydrography. And so we thought maybe we should have a closer view at the catchment bas basin of the, the river Zen and look at all its tributary valleys, look at all the secondary rivers that actually bring the water to the main river that is canalized. And while doing this, we, 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 we took again the map that we had made of all the green spaces of Brussels. And then these other lines show the different tributary rivers bringing the water towards the main valley with its invisible river. And suddenly we understood that 80% of the existing fragmented green space is not so fragmented, but of course lies in the, the floodplain of these tributary uh, rivers. And so suddenly a, a kind of system became, a, became apparent. And we said, ah, what we have to do is, is we have to reinforce these eight tributary rivers, make a, a, a landscape structure out of them that can create a new image for Brussels. And instead of being sad about having lost the river, we can be happy and, and, and confident in, in, in the idea that we can use these eight tributary rivers to create eight projects um, um, to bring a sustainable green within the city. Sustainable, large scale, and at the same time solving the flood problems um, of Brussels. We were together with the, the University of Brussels um, to see how we could actually stock water uh, um, um, and, and, and use these new parks um, to, to reduce the, the flood risks in Brussels. These points are all the, 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 um, the different f f f uh, inundations that they had over the last, last uh, five years. We do this kind of alliances because, of course, to make this kind of large-scale landscape interventions, you need money. Nobody's willing to pay for that unless it helps solve another problem. So if we can take money away from, from money spent on inundations and try to prevent it, we can mobilize authorities to, um, to implement uh, these kind of schemes. And so we told them it's quite interesting because Brussels, I don't know if you know the city, but it's, it's, it's mainly 19 municipalities. It, there's no one single image. And so we said instead of having this image of a river that doesn't exist for a city that doesn't exist, we can have eight tributary rivers for 19 municipalities. And so it's a much more contemporary view or contemporary image for, for, for a city than this kind of um, trying to bring something back that's already lost. I will show this for one uh, tributary uh, river, the Molenbeek. Where actually once we've seen this, and, and in the office I, I most of the time I try not to go visit the site before we've done this kind of reading based on the aerial uh, photograph because this reading reveals a landscape that you cannot see uh, on the site itself. Once, of course, you've seen this, this, this tributary valley, you understand that these nice lakes in a nice park are actually connected to this little stream, are connected to this little waterway, and are connected even to this little ditch um, within the forest further away. Because suddenly, suddenly all this becomes a system and you can start to imagine from the, 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 the very um, unpronounced high differences, you can start looking for allies. For example, the existing parks that are now all closed off and, and only used by the, the, the people living around them. Suddenly you can, you can start imagining a continuous space. You can start to imagine that some industrial zones could be part of that, some agricultural zones could be part of that, and suddenly you can imagine a, a, a continuous park that changes the value of the, 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 the existing housing around it, and that suddenly becomes an, an, an attraction for a much larger area, not only the people living around it, but it, com it becomes a park of about seven kilometers long. Um, it becomes a kind of new park system, if we want, um, that, that I think profoundly changes the way people live around that, uh, that area. We compared it also to make the authorities feel good with known examples. Central Park, 4.7 kilometers. Hyde Park or the Royal Parks in London, about 4.4 kilometers. And suddenly in Brussels, 7.7 .7 kilometers by just connecting the existing green spaces. It's also interesting to see that Olmsted 
could draw it his own rectangle and then the city developed around it. In London, it's, it's, it's a juxtaposition of existing parks that were royal and that became public. So the form is less defined. And here, even less defined, we, we really try to, to incorporate an, anything that could help us to create this open space. And so you get a form that's, that's the, 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 the result of the, the, um, the elements that, uh, that could help us create it. This is the one I've shown you, but the same counts for the seven other tributary rivers. And I've used the word park system, but I think this is more like a landscape structure. And so I'm making a kind of reference and a kind of follow-up, maybe, of one of the greatest landscape architects um, that lived just here. This is a chain of lakes in Minneapolis, um, designed by Olmsted. And when he designed this in mid-19th century, he connected the existing lakes into a, a park system around the industrial town of Minneapolis. He did this a priori, and nowadays this chain of lakes organizes the whole of urban sprawl around the city that has developed. It, 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 it organizes the, the whole of the hydrography, um, the inundations, the, the, the water problematics of that city. So, so Olmsted could do this before the urban sprawl. He did it in many cities, also I could not, not show this image, of course. Emerald necklace um, in Boston, where again, Franklin Park, uh, Arnold uh, Arboretum, were all connected into, again, this, this continuous system of parks. That also these days, and it's, it's great to see that even at night, people are jogging along the Emerald necklace. It, it, it creates a kind of nature within the city fabric that I, I think we, we lost a bit in Europe, and that's just, that's just amazing. And I think as, as, as much as Olmsted was visionary and could do this a priori. We're in a situation that we have to do this a posteriori, and we have to go with our loop, look for, for, for green allies, and look for all the elements that could help create this uh, landscape structure as a kind of um, heritage of the park system ideology. Second project, Ingel Munster, which seems a very difficult name, but actually it means English monastery, um, and it, it lies right in the middle of this terrible urban sprawl. There was a competition in 2008, and I remember the, the, the mayor telling us during the brief that not only um, did he have a small, um, a small city of about 12,000 inhabitants, it was cut by this terrible canal, and so there was an Inglemister North and an Inglemister South, and, and, and the competition actually was held to create a new plaza around the, the, um, the church and a new plaza around uh, the station. Here you can perfectly see this, this endless urban sprawl. You see all these uh, single housing units. You see these this, uh, industrial boxes. And there's really no end to it from, from court track all the way to Lille, about uh, passing by... by by all these villages, it's, it's, it's just endless. It's, 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 it's at the same time fascinating and at the same time just, uh, yeah, it's just, just revolting. It's, 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 the, it's the end of what, everything we've learned, you know? It, it, so it's, it's, it's really interesting at the same time. So my first point was, well, at least, at least he has a river. At least he, he has this waterway and that was doubled by, by the canal. At least there is a high difference. At least we could imagine a floodplain. We could imagine a landscape. We could imagine um, creating or, 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 or changing the, 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 the view of, of this, this canal as being an element that cuts to an element that binds. <coughs> and making these images, and again, cartography is key, we saw that the two plazas of the, composition, of the competitions were lying at the edge of the original floodplain, which was characterized, of course, by the, the, the original roads linking the different villages. So we thought, in, 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 instead of making Plaza 1 and Plaza 2, can we not make one single center for the this, uh, this city, connecting both parts and, and, and revealing, in a way, the valley um, that connects them? 
And so we, we, we teamed up with 360 architects from Ghent, but also with Laurent Ney, um, uh, uh, an, an engineer from Luxembourg, so, so that we could both um, design the, the, the bridge, design the new station, and design the, 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 the public space. And so we said, instead of, of, of going down into the valley from the church, pass over the little river that was canalized, go down, and then have a typical bridge over the canal made by the, 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 the people who, from, from, uh, from the waterways, go down again and go back up to the railway station. Can we not, with a gentle slope of 3%, go up, go back down, almost on a horizontal platform spanning the valley, and suddenly while, while walking on this platform, the valley suddenly appears underneath your feet, the, 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 the little waterway is taken out of its canalization, and there's this, this bigger bridge suddenly creates the, 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 the valley as a, as, a, as a valuable element in, a, in the city fabric. And so within this, this, this endless urban sprawl, suddenly a centrality is created. When you drive through this, you will have known that you passed the center of Ingelmünster. And the two plazas together create a, a, um, a kind of void, create a, a moment of, of calm within um, this very busy um, um, it's very busy urban sprawl. So these Im images show it quite well. The, the, um, the little river, the canal, and then the platform that spans um, the, the, the valley. And, 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 and in a way, without even touching the valley, suddenly makes it appear in, in a kind of opposition. Um, the... the, the this platform cr creates a, um, a reference, and all the elements, the, the, the existing castle, uh, for example, the church, the, the station, relates to this platform. And, and, and when I talked in the, in the beginning about territorial anchorage, this platform helps um, all the elements to be situated and to, to, to find a relationship um, with uh, the, the, the valley. We started with the, the, the north. This was the existing situation. This is the church, this is the, the city hall. This was parking, this was parking, this was parking, this was parking. Like in most um, cities and villages in Europe, public space equals parking. And so the first thing you have to do, of course, is make a bigger parking somewhere else to then liberate space um, to create uh, actual public space that's not uh, parking. So the first thing we did is we, we, we cleared it a bit. Took everything out that, that, that wasn't necessary. We redrew the infrastructure to its minimal um, proportions while creating larger terraces um, for the housing around it. Of course, we kept the church and the city hall. We investigated where the old wall around the, 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 the castle um, was lying. We worked in very close collaboration with the with, uh, monuments and landscapes, and we actually discovered that it was not where they thought it was, that it was, uh, it was, it was somewhere else, so we could use that to, to, to exchange land with the, the owners of the castle. And then we put in a grid system of trees to end the, 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 the valley. We put in this, this grid to, to, to show that it's not the, the spontaneous trees along the waterway, but it's, it's an organized grid that, that gives a proper end to the, 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 the floodplain. And at the same time, it organizes the space. It organizes the, the, the weekly market that was happening on the, the, the marketplace. And it helped organize the, 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 the bigger parking behind the, um, the city hall. And what was very important for me was to, to not make a green parking, but make a green structure and oh yes, you could also park underneath it. But it was very important that, that it was not just a nice parking lot or a better parking lot, but actually a, a, um, truly a green structure in face with the valley, in face with um, its, its, um, its territorial position. And yes, it allowed uh, parking at the same time. As you can see, the, 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 um, the church was again standing in the middle of, a, of the plaza and we created all this space um, around it. 
in the isometric view, you, you, can, you get this, uh, this image. Also, in, 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 the, in, the, in the ambition of recreating the, the, the valley, we, we worked on the slopes and we, re, we redid the whole um, heights of, 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 of this area to have one single slope of 2% sloping down, which also helped in a very uh, simple way to, to, um, to evacuate all the, the rainwater. We could just have simple uh, line gutters. And the church then needed a new plinth to accommodate for the height difference, and the plinth became a kind of a um, street furniture, um, as you'll see in the coming images. The tree choice was, it was a very um, tough battle. I wanted a, a tree that follows the seasons, follows the rhythm of the valley, while not being um, a, a leafy tree. So we chose for the, the, the water cypress, uh, Metasecoia clyptus troboides, which has needles, but it loses its needles in, in autumn um, and gets this very electrical green needles uh, back, in, back in spring. So it's a tree that follows the rhythm of the valley while not being a tree of the valley. Which we explored here in these two perspectives or in this model. And we started building the, the first two phases. The, the first two phases are actually finished. And I, I, I really appreciated that the contractor started by planting the trees and then making the parking lots. He didn't see any of my presentations. I think it was a much more economical reason. But the same way, he, he, he did what we thought was important. First, create this very strong green structure and then allowing parking, parking to be organized underneath it. But when the parking is empty in spring with the, 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 this, this Narcissus, suddenly for this little boy, the, the, the parking becomes a public space. Uh, he loved the, the, the noise of the, the basalt <coughs> underneath his feet. While in, in, in autumn, the, the ornamental grasses would capture the light and, and create, a, again, a different kind of feeling. The parking spaces are in, in this loose basalt, which at the same time um, are the reservoir for the water. Uh, we, we, we calculated the, the foundations and we, we dimensioned them in such a way that, that actually the, the foundations themselves are the, 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 the water reservoir for the, the, the rainwater and allow the water to be evaporated back into the, the, the skies when the rain is over. As you can see, there is no gutter at all, so everything is organized within um, the design of these, uh, these parking spaces. This is the, the, the um, these concrete steps around the, the, the church um, necessary because of the, the new single slope towards the valley. Here's a water element we designed. It's a, it's a 17 ton one single concrete block uh, that serves as a water table. And that creates the, 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 the right balance with the church and the, the, um, the little chapels, while at the same time it becomes a water element for the kids um, in the weekend. And then at, 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 at the end of the, of the plaza towards the, the, the valley, we created this, this uh, interactive water element. And what was really great to see is that the, this, this, this small town that never connect that never has, has known public space and not, didn't really know how to, to use it, suddenly discovered this kind of space that they could use as, as they would like. And for example, in the weekends, the Boy Scouts would come to the water element with their swimming suits and would play in it. And, and, and suddenly the, the mayor told me that many, many inhabitants asked to, 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 to use the space for different activities. And it was really, for me, it was really interesting because in, in, in it was a, a very, it was, it was a long um, process with many uh, participative moments. And, and in the beginning, I really had a very hard time to, to explain to him why we were creating public space. Because for them, public space was only useful when there was cars on it. If there was no cars on it, it was, seemed completely senseless. And, and I remember in one meeting, the, 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 that is people asked me, so, so the parking spaces in front of a church will be gone. I was like, yes, they will be gone because we'll make a big parking lot behind the, the church. 
somebody else. But what happens to the parking spaces in front of a church? Like, well, they will be gone. It will be an open space. And somebody, said, what, what happens on this open space? I was like, uh, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> and and so, so it was really funny because somebody would tell me, but you think I will be walking circles on your on your useless space? And I was like, no, no. And, and, but so it's really interesting that that this kind of urbanity. You, I think most of us come from cities or, or we know city life. I think many of us have, have lost this idea of what's urbanity and what's the, the use of public space. So it's this, this dialogue I thought was really, really interesting and, and really en, en, uh, enriching. And, and right now, the, 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 yeah, the, there's a real feel of, of, um, of, of, of again discovering public space, of using it in different ways and, and creating um, yeah, the essence of public space, a space that's public for, uh, for all. I have this uh, Google Earth before, where you could see the church and parking, 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 parking. This is still in construction in this image, but you can see here the, 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 the structure that we created in the continuation of, uh, of the valley. So this, this methodology of, of, of reading the, 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 the existing land, of, of really trying to to, to understand its, its different elements and to, to recreate combinations of these elements um, to, create, to create landscape structure. We also use it when we work abroad. Um, here, together with DGT Architects from Paris, um, we won a competition for the Estonian National Museum um, in the second city of Estonia, uh, Tartu. And here we're in a very different situation. Um, the 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 city of Tartu was basically um, a garnison city built by the, the, the Russians during the Second World War um, to allow an endless series of Tupolevs to land and to, 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 to bring tanks to the, the, the city as a stronghold against uh, Nazi Germany. And so the first idea of the Estonians when they won back their independence was to blow up the, the tarmac but the concrete was four meters deep, armed, one kilometer long, 110 meters wide, so that was just impossible. So they then decided to, to create a competition for the, 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 the new museum um, of Estonian culture um, in, the, in that area. And so we, we, we did our reading as usual. This is the, all the concrete spaces. What you can see is this is the, 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 the landing strip, and these are kind of like parking lots for um, for airplanes, parking lots protected by little mounds, by little hills, so a tank could not shoot on, uh, on the airplane. So it's really interesting that suddenly this is a, a, an extremely artificial landscape, but very much there. And then a series of lakes, uh, as you can see on this image. And then this is really interesting, this is an image that we redrew um, from, uh, from Google Earth where you could see that, that there was an enormous spontaneous growth of trees the moment the Russians left, mm -hmm. because they left the airspace, nobody touched it, and tree, trees just started um, springing up again. And, and I was really touched by this, because in a way I thought that the, um, since the Russians left, the Estonians tried to, to uh, they regained their independence, and, and as a young country tried to, to, yeah, to, to to, to become a, a real country again. Just like this side, the Russians left and, and these trees tried to make a new landscape again, very Estonian. And so, so, so I thought it was, yeah, there was some, something very poetical in that. And on site there was affirmed, because for example, on, on these protective mounds, suddenly uh, uh, plants would, would, would uh, transform them. The lakes were very nice too, and then there was this, this beautiful meadows that nobody ever planted, but that just suddenly were there. You see the willows, you see a very young and spontaneous um, vegetation. That in winter would completely change, and, and, and winter lasts six months uh, in Estonia. But again, a very, very poetical and a bit out of the world um, kind of side that I thought was, that was, I was, I was very much touched by it, and so I tried to, 
explain my clients that, that we should keep this and, 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 and show this to the visitors of the museum. While they, because they were in a way happy that, to have a European team, they kind of would have wanted us to, to make a Chateau de Versailles, you know, like a kind of hyper, hyper European space. And, and I told them, no, actually, what we have to do is, is, is reveal the existing. And, and so it, we, we made a new lake here and connected these four lakes in, 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 a, in a kind of hydrographic system. Apparently, they had a problem with, with, uh, with water, so they, 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 they understood that this could help create a, a kind of overflow and, and dug the lake immediately. The, 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 the museum itself by the architects was laid on the, the, the landing strip as, as a kind of end of the landing strip. So the first move was to, to, to make this, this uh, contemporary chain of lakes, if you like. And the second move was to make a, a, um, an oversized grid, a grid of 19 meters wide. 19 meters is very wide. And that's a, a tree here and a tree in the, in the other corner. But a, a tree grid as a kind of framing of the spontaneous landscape around um, the new museum. And so we said, like, actually, we keep everything as it is, and we only do, do those two, two actions, and then create a path system floating a bit above the ground so that people could actually suddenly discover the, med the meadow, discover the, the spont spontaneous vegetation as something precious, as something that you don't touch, um, but that you, d that, that you actually only, only walk through. And for example, the, 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 all the, the, the necessary parking lots for the people working in the museum, we organized on the, the, the existing um, parking lots for, uh, for the airplanes. And I, I, I showed them these images that, that I would take from the train uh, between Tartu and Tallinn. And especially this one, where suddenly um, you can see that this plot was, was, a, was a, um, the trees were cut um, for, a, for a wood production. They would only keep the, 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 the biggest ones, the biggest specimens for reforestation. And this was exactly the image I wanted to create, a kind of wider frame that, that lets you read the landscape um, behind it. They finally accepted, but I never knew if it was because my proposition was so cheap or <laughs> if they really, really liked it. But so they started digging the, 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 um, the lake um, and they started making um, this, uh, this, yeah, this, this kind of landscape that reveals the existing landscape. And so here you see the final plants, the, the, the oversized um, grid, all, all the, 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 the entry functions of the museum, and then this, this chain of lakes crossing through it. Third project in Arle, in the south of France. This is the project that we're doing together with Frank Gehry. Our client is the, the Luma Foundation. Um, and the Luma Foundation wants to create a, um, a center for the production of art um, on the site of the Parc des Ateliers, which is a, an, an, a former site of the, the, um, the, um, the rail roads of France where they would repair uh, trains. And here it was really interesting for us to suddenly found ourselves in, in, a, in, a, in an extremely rich uh, environment. Arle lies right here. And it's actually, uh, finds itself at, at the, 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 um, the intersection of, of three very interesting and very strong um, geomorphological entities. La Croix, which is the, the old flood plain of a, of a glacier, and which is, which is actually uh, completely devoid of trees uh, because it has all these this, this big stones um, at the surface. The Camargue, which is the, the, um, the, the, the place where the, where the, where the ocean and the, and the Rhone would, uh, would come together, and you see all this, uh, this kind of a tormented uh, a landscape. And then the Alpi, which is the southern part of the Alps. The Alps is lying up there. And so suddenly uh, our, our sides seem to be, uh, yeah, see, seem to be, be um, seem to be touched with these tentacles by, by, by these different landscapes. And, and from the beginning, we asked ourselves, what, what does that mean? What, what does it mean that, that we have such a strong um, landscape entities around our, our site? Our site that itself 
was completely empty. And so, so we questioned how, how, um, how we could refer to these landscapes, um, especially since uh, the family of our client um, was one of the, 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 the main protectors of the, the, the wetlands of the Camargue. And so, again, we did this reading of the, of the existing situation, both in, in, in plan, um, as in texture, as in colors, and we tried to understand the, 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 the materials that we could work with from the Camargue, from the Cro, and from the, uh, the LP. And so we really took the time to, to, um, to explore these landscapes and to really get a, get, uh, get a feel for the, 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 their, the, their richness. A reading at the, the, the scale of the city, and you can see a site right here. You can see the, the industrial buildings where the trains would be, uh, would be repaired. And then you see the, the, the city of Arles, which actually during the Roman times was the second city after Rome, with the amphitheater, a theater, and, and, a, and a very uh, small urban fabric um, dating from the Roman times. Starting from the, the amphitheater and the theater, you get this very small and, 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 and very mineral, mineral um, plazas in the, the city center itself. And the more we get out of the city, the more the, 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 the open space grows. And we could see that our site was actually on the, on the, on the, on the, on the fourth circle in between the, 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 um, the city fabric uh, of Arles and the kind of new fabric, sport fields, uh, um, malls, new development that was being created uh, outside of the city of Arles. And so we said, actually, this is a, this is a great opportunity to have this this dimension of, of open space, we should be very thoughtful of, of, of how to create a new kind of open space for a city that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's characterized by, by this very uh, small, scale, small scale open space in the city itself, and then this kind of two big spaces around it. And so I said, actually, the, 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 the platform that was created by the railroad um, we should keep this kind of special quality of an artificial platform. Because actually they, they, they excavated our, a horizontal platform within the rocks, as you can see here, that almost like a wedge enters into the, the city fabric of Arles. So first idea was how can we create this kind of special condition of an island? And we compared it to a, a number of known islands in, uh, in Paris. For example, we could see that it almost had the same dimensions as the the Ile Saint-Louis uh, in Paris. So there was this kind of possibility of an island of, of creating a kind of different um, space. Secondly, how to connect it with the existing city. It was an industrial um, um, a zone that was fenced off with a wall. How could we reconnect it? And here we started reading the, the existing trees and we discovered that there was a kind of interesting figure we call it the loop of trees that would actually connect most of the, the public spaces of Arles one with another. And this loop of trees touches twice with our site, once in the north and once in the south. And so we said, okay, this, this, this could be the, the occasion to use this loop of trees to create um, entrances to the site that would complete the scheme um, that is existing in, uh, in Arles. And, and so we said at the same time, the site where before trains were repaired and now art will be made, we should keep this, this, its, its, uh, its peculiar, peculiar, peculiar quality. And at the same time, in a kind of overlay, the loop of trees helps connect it with the, with the city. And Again, in, 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 in Belgium, we needed this kind of very precise reading to, as you have seen, if even find a, a very small stream to, to at least um, try to bring this nature or these this natural elements back into a uh, into picture. Here, suddenly, it, 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 uh, we were a bit um, amazed by everything we found. But we also achieved in, in, in showing the, the people from Arles, their city, in a, in a new way. And for example, the mayor lately has, has started a, um, a commission for the loop of trees to become a real element structuring the city of, uh, of Arles. 
And so starting from the north, the, 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 the loop of trees is extended into a platform that helps or that, that organizes the, the arrival into the, the, the park. And the reference uh, is the Alpi, a very stony um, environment where in the, in the cracks nature would grow. And so we, we, we conceived a plaza where you, you also have this, this, this stony environment and, and nature springing out of, a, of, a, of little holes, holes within this uh, mineral carpet. The entrance from the south is a continuation of a canal that runs uh, uh, right there. And there the reference is much more the, 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 um, the, the Camargue with its vegetation on, on, a, on a very um, shallow, um, um, shallow piece of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of earth. And where similarly we're, we're referring to this, um, to this, 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 uh, this, this diff very different quality of a, of, a, of a landscape. While in the middle part, we made a very big open plaza where a water element could be uh, um, imagined and it would be surrounded by a number of, of groves, different distances, different species, different atmospheres, different light, that in a way, again refers to the, 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 the orchards, the olive orchards at the foot of the, the, the Alpi, and where also the, 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 um, the kind of logic of optimizing every plot creates a randomness that, that, um, that creates different um, um, atmospheres within the, the, the same logic. And so here you see this, this, uh, this loop of trees running around the side, the entrance from the south, the entrance from the north, and the different sequences that organize this 10 hectare um, open space. A reading at different levels, from the very high level to the city level, to the site level, but also to the, the level of the, the vegetation that grows in, in these three um, different um, biotopes, the Alpi, the Camargue, and the Cro. And then we took a kind of selection of these existing plants to try to program nature year round on the side. Because talking to the different artists that work on, on, on this project, we thought it was interesting to not only have art as a program element of the site, but also the vegetation itself. And like if you would get a program of the, the what's happening in the year, you can see what's happening in the month of June, but also the plants that would be flowering, the plants that, that, that would be in leaves and see the, 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 the vegetation as part of the program of the site. And even the migration of the birds, we said it could be really interesting to see if, if um, with the, the, the landscapes that we're creating, that we would even have my, my, the, the migration of the birds apparent uh, on site. And so we, with this reading and with this, this, um, these elements, we've, we, we try to, to anchor this, this, as you can see, this, this very hard uh, concrete site within the, 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 the city fabric, but also reconnect it with the Cro, the Alpi, and the Camargue, and, and in a way be a kind of kaleidoscope of these three, uh, um, these three larger uh, landscapes. This uh, construction should start um, uh, next year. And then I come to a very different scale, um, the scale of a, of, a, of a garden, where of course this, this, this kind of reading of the territory becomes um, very different. It was more the, 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 um, the reading of a, of, a, of a potential. The garden is four by eight meters, so that's about um, 14 by 28 feet, which is actually the, the space uh, we have here, so it's, it's really, really small. Surrounded on three sides by, uh, by high buildings, five levels, three levels, and a, and a party wall on the other side. And from the beginning, in the beginning I called it dark garden because it was so dark in there. But now we call it sunken garden because it sounds just a bit more positive. <laughs> But from the beginning was this idea, what, 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 ca what can we do there? And, and, and in a way we thought uh, the, the, the building is, is a, is in, lies in the center of London, is protected by national heritage. And so I thought maybe 
maybe there's some kind of strange climate happening there. It's protected from the winds. The, the, in winter, the, the, the tree facades are heated. And of course, there is a kind of heat loss, especially with these old buildings. Um, and so we thought, uh, I remember during the, 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 the renovation of the building, I asked the, the, the foreman to take temperature, both on street level and inside the, the sunken garden. And we could see there was always a two to three degrees difference. Um, and we did this during the whole winter, and we saw that it never freezes in the garden. And this, of course, is, is extremely important in the choice of plants because freezing or not freezing is a very different, um, make, makes, you, makes your choice um, very different. And since it never froze, we took the, the risk to say, okay, it'll never freeze in the garden. What can we do? How can we not reveal the territorial situation of the garden, but actually the climatic situation of the garden? How can we reveal the fact that in that garden, climate is different than outside on the street. And so we, we, looking at it in more detail, we saw that actually we could find the, 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 um, the climatic situation of, a, of an exotic forest where the, 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 the buildings create the canopy or, or, or let's say that the buildings um, take the role of the canopy of the higher trees, bringing shadow, um, protecting it from the winds. The only thing that was lacking was humidity so we thought maybe if we can add humidity, we can, we can go in, 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 a, in, a, in a very different, um, we can create this, this very different um, biotope. So we started looking into to different plants. Um, and so we, we, we my, 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 I don't know, my, my vision was to make something that, that, that would pre-exist the building. Like, like, like if the building would have been built around this, uh, this sunken garden. And it was a kind of interesting switch because the building, of course, allows this biotope. So you create a biotope that pre-exists the building that allows it to exist. So it, you come in, into a kind of thing that starts to be really interesting. And then, for example, the, 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 the terraces, I thought, needs to be pre-existing. And so we looked at the... the, the um, the pavements uh, outside the buildings, they were all made in York stone. So we decided let's make terraces or let in, in slabs of New York stone, you know, like, like the thing that would precede the York stone. And so we went to, um, to different tree nurseries to, to choose the, the tree ferns or the fern trees. Antarctica Dixonia. And then I went to, the, to a quarry um, in Manchester to find uh, the York stone, and we chose them, I chose them myself. The, so we had these big slabs that they gave us for free because they, they couldn't do anything with them. We had them come to the street and had a, had a big crane uh, hired and had three tons of stones and the highest <laughs> fern trees of London, I think even of England, planted into the garden. Then we had this whole misting system installed to, to really create the, 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 the perfect climatic conditions for this garden. We didn't need any irrigation. The, the, the misting system did that for us. And so suddenly, four by eight meters, again, it's really this, uh, the space we have here. You would go in there and, and <laughs> you felt like you were in National Geographic, you know. <laughs> so here you see the, 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 the slab. We, we, we added a kind of mirror system that would make it uh, look uh, look bigger. We added a, we, we really worked on the, on the on the soil together with a bot botanical expert and the trees have grown uh, about half a meter in the last uh, two years so I think right now it's, it's really the, the biggest fern tree of, uh, of the United Kingdom in that very small garden. Even the plants that we had provided underneath are not working very well because the, 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 <laughs> the fern trees are just so so happy. And so this is before, and this is the, the neighbors, this is the, the, the party wall, and this is after. And so I, I, I really like this project because it's, it's always about revealing something, and that revealing could be a characteristic of the territory, but it can also be an unseen climatic characteristic. 
And so for our last project, I want to push that even, even further. In two years ago, uh, Philippe Perino, who is a French uh, artist, um, asked me if I wanted to collaborate with him on his um, latest um, movie project, uh, a short movie, where he said he wanted to he wanted to create a landscape that could only exist in a movie, um, and this landscape should be of a planet where life would be possible. And it was based on the assumption that for a very long time, the NASA was looking for life on other planets based on the similar system to ours, one sun, one planet. And recently, um, they've been looking into a, um, a different situation where two or three suns could, from a bigger distance could provide um, uh, the, 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 the right conditions for life to be possible. And those Areas where that would be possible are called continuously habitable zones. It's a term from, uh, from NASA. Um, and so they, suddenly they, they, they understood that instead of, let's say, the, 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 a certain number of, of planets that, that could uh, have life, of course, suddenly that, would, that was enormously, enormously expanded. And so Philippe asked me, like, are, are you, can, can you make me um, a landscape that would represent this, this, uh, this, this uh, CHZ? which is the name of, uh, of the movie. And it was, it was a very, very interesting um, journey because he, he, he got five plots um, to work on, three in Stuttgart and two in Porto, a bit by accident. And so the idea was how can we make a landscape that only exists in a movie on three plots, on five plots in, uh, in two countries. And so we started the, the, um, our typical reading of every site, going on site, um, trying to, to reveal the, the, the essence of each of these plots and trying to think of a, of, a, of a landscape that could be made with five sites. And the idea would be that, of course, in, in the movie, you can end one shot, make another one, and you can make a continuous walk through the garden that would exist on different, uh, different lots. But it's quite tough because Philippe, never really said what he wanted, and I was a bit lost. And we would have all these workshops. Um, and I was looking in plan to, to create a, um, a continuous landscape. And we made models. Like, is it, is it, is it a, a circular landscape based on these plots? Well, well suddenly I thought, no, it's not, in, it's not in plan, it's in section, of course, it's in section, because because a movie works in section, a movie works with cuts, a movie, a movie doesn't work in plan but in, in, a, in elevation. And so we thought, should we not make a, since we didn't really know what, kind, what kind of landscape to make, I thought, let's make an exemplary landscape, let's make the, the most or the best or the most archetype landscape that you could make. So a plateau, a hillside, a valley, a stepped garden, some uprooted plants, and we, we try to, 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 yeah, to come to a kind of imaginary, exemplary landscape based on the, on the five plots. And once we had the section, uh, we could start to, to, to work on the, on the detailed plants. We made this kind of, uh, this, this is the true section of the different sides that we had. And we then put them in plan to see how, how, how we could imagine different shots to create this landscape that would only exist in the movie. Then, for some kind of reason, all of this needed to, made, to be made in one uh, site, because um, it was just too difficult to, to, to film in, uh, in, in five sites in, in two countries. And so again, it was, it was, it was like, oh, what to do now? And actually, as, as we, as we had defined the, 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 the essential characteristics for each site, we said, let's, let's find these characteristics again on the one single site that we have. So basically, the, the, the different sites from Stuttgart suddenly migrated to, to, to the big site we had in Porto. And, and what I liked about it is that we never, um, we, we always kept the kind of same rigorous um, approach in, in, in 
reading aside, revealing its characteristics and seeing what that, that could mean. But suddenly, these characteristics of, 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 a, of a plot in Stuttgart were refound on the plot in, uh, in Porto. And so we started uprooting some trees, trying to reveal some kind of unseen characteristics together with the fire brigade of, uh, of Porto. And trying by, by, by scratching the earth, by, by burning the earth, by, by, by making holes to, to, yeah, to reveal this kind of darker side um, of the territory that we then planted with black plants. Because in this idea of, of, of two suns, photosynthesis would be accelerated and plants would be black. And we then filmed, filmed the, 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 the side. And so for me, it was really a discovery because we're so used, to, I mean, we're, 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 we're so not um, advanced, we landscape architects. I mean, so suddenly in, in, on a movie set, you put a spot and, and the whole thing changes and you, you're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, really, yeah, it was really great. Like suddenly, all these tricks, you know, that we, we we don't use tricks. And suddenly, the movie itself. And here, I, I show you some film stills. Uh, you can see this is the scene from the camera. Here, you see the two sons. And suddenly, uh, um, uh, this this strange place is is uh, is revealed. This is a, a mineral river. And so we, we put, put um, what do you call it, um, diamond dust in there, so suddenly to, to get these kind of reflections. And I, and I understood very, something very, I think something that, that's really changing the way I, I'm, I'm seeing landscape. Um, and that is that, that what, what I would usually make is images, and those images produce a reality. While in, in, uh, in the movies, you make a reality that produces an image. And so it's a very different approach. Um, a very different approach that, that suddenly creates a kind of continuous system in which reality aspires to an image, that image creates a reality, and that reality produces again an image. And so you're in kind of const constant spiral of, 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 of reality image, reality image, and, and this, this constant transformation I think is really, is really, it's really very important. And so also here in this, in this, in this kind of inverse world, when, I, when, when, we, when we were finished um, constructing the garden, we asked for a, an official land meter from Portugal to, to actually draw what we had done. Instead of we drawing it and then somebody else making it, we made it and then we asked somebody else to draw it. And then we rented a helicopter to actually see what we had done. And, and so you get this very strange landscape that, that for me works from the sky and seen through a camera. But in reality, when you walk there, it's, 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 it's too weird. It doesn't, it doesn't work at a scale of, of, a, of, a, of a visitor. It only works seen from very high or from very, from very close by. So suddenly scale becomes something different too. And I think I, I, I added this, this, uh, this, this project because I, I think starting from a frustration with the, the um, urban sprawl in Flanders, developing this methodology where, where the, the, a precise reading of the existing situation that can be the, 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 the actual um, side, but it can be climate, that can be uh, context. Starting from this reading, a kind of new way of... of um, of, of seeing reality is, is, uh, is produced, which then in turn um, produces a, a, a reality. And I think in, 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 in the, the movie with uh, Philippe Arendo, we, we, we push that kind of reflection to its, to its furthest uh, dimension by, by, by this assumption of a, of a different uh, solar system. And so in, in all the projects that we're, that we're making, 
we're always trying to to um, to reveal something that's that's unseen but that that is there and in a way we're, we're trying to to um, to look for the desire um, of the site what 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 can the site become and it's, it's really interesting that we we an art an architect would mostly work with program we, we never start from program we, we always start from the, the 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 reading of the site itself and and so in the end uh, th through through the, the, the um, through the work we do we try to 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 resu resume the the the, um, the, 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 the intent to a final symbol, and this symbol for me is really, it's really important. Sometimes it comes in the beginning, sometimes it comes at the end, sometimes it comes two years after the building is, is constructed. But it's, for me, it's a, it's, it's a symbol that, that, that is the, 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 the maximum reduction of the, 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 um, of the, of the project itself. In, in, in a way, for me, it's, it's the, the, um, the desire of a, of a, of a land to, to, b to become a landscape in one single uh, drawing. Thank you very much. Um, I know people are going to get back, but maybe time for one or two questions. Okay. Yeah. Have you introduced yourself? I was surprised that you didn't have any I was, uh, I was very impressed by your presentation of the uh, the film at the end because it, it helped me understand your process um, uh, as some kind of mise en scène, this kind of reversal of building a reality to create a fiction or creating a fiction to construe reality. And I was very impressed then, because you used a term earlier, um, mind you, this isn't a question, it's more of a comment, so, but um, I was very struck by using the term uh, a posteriori, and I was it it struck me that was very true to your process, and it made me think about um, experimental method because um, it often, or I should say, it once been um, there was this juxtaposition between a priori methods where you only believe results that are um, ensue from your experimental practice, and that's where you place your trust. And your uh, reversal of that and trying to coax out conditions that are not otherwise seen and then verify them through your own um, design intervention. I found that very refreshing um, approach, but also just to say that the, your work in film very helpfully clarified that as a uh, productive method by a change in medium in that sense. Yeah, it, it's, it's for me as well. <laughs> we're, we're also working with, with Philippe really, really helped to, to, yeah, to, to push this method much further because of course he's, he's a, he was my client, but it's a strange, m mostly my client is, cares about his parking spaces and mm -hmm. he didn't really care about that. He would just push me further and further. So it's really interesting to, to, yeah, to come to this essential understanding also between the, the difference between reality and image. Just continuing what Ed was saying about the film, I, I, it's it's a fascinating project uh, that you presented. But I, I also I don't know if it's a question or more more a comment. But the fact that landscape has been um, culturally and historically related to the view, the concept of the view, that we create the sequence, we create what we want to see. There's al always a question: What do you see? But in the film, it's about the frame, right? Because you are actually more attentive to the process. You're not really creating spaces. You are creating a process of transformation, a condition that then you frame through the eye of the camera. I'm wondering if, if that, what are the implications, of the few imp implications on your process? The, the, um, what, what was so interesting in the film was the collaboration. Because I was making a, I was really trying to make a landscape narrative. Because again, I had no program. Philip was like, "Yeah, do do as usual." <laughs> so I'm not uh, normally I don't, I don't this kind of, I don't do this kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> so so there was no as usual, and so so um, this kind of exemplary landscape helped me to 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 imagine what I would have done. I was like, "Okay, I will forget about what he wants. I'll just make my landscape, and then up to him how he wants to film it." And so I made a whole narrative that works, 
But he didn't care about that. He, he, he took the side and then made his narrative out of it. And what's really interesting is that you, you feel this kind of double logic if you see the movie. You feel that there is a kind of logic, but you don't get it because there's different layers of logic. And I, I think that's, and that's why I wanted to show this project, which, which mo mostly I don't show because it's, yeah, it's a bit odd. But I think I'm, I'm much more interested in, in, yeah, in, in pushing that much further. Like, like, like how can you, uh, for uh, this idea of how can a landscape only exist in a movie, for example, that's, that's I think that's, um, yeah, there's much more to explore. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.